home, home on the range where the deer and the antelope play. <laughs> well, that old songwriter got it right. If you like the wide open spaces of North America, out in the plains is a place to be for the deer and the antelope. And of course, the antelope is really the pronghorn. North American antelope are not antelope. Uh, Africa has antelope. India and Asia have antelope. We have the pronghorn. It is the only surviving member of an entire genus. Uh, according to the fossil record, there were several um, crazy shaped horned animals <laughs> like pronghorns. But the reason pronghorn are distinctive, one of the reasons, is that they actually shed their horn. Horns are generally known as a lifelong uh, head growth on an animal. Cattle and sheep and such, or they grow horns. Year after year after year, they just increase the size. They don't shed them the way deer do. But pronghorn do, but they do leave a bony core sticking out. So that's pretty cool. There's a lot of cool things about pronghorn. Um, and one of them is their big eyes for seeing danger coming from a long way off. And that makes them a diurnal animal out on the open plains. And that's why I think it's so fun to hunt them because you can see them. And you can see them from a long distance and watch their antics. None of this sitting in a thicket hoping something comes by <laughs> to brighten up your day. You can generally be looking at pronghorn most of the day while you're hunting. You might not get real close to them, <laughs> but uh, that's the challenge. And this article is uh, called Discovering Pronghorns. And let's see, this was from uh, American Hunter Magazine back in 1996. And by then, I had done quite a bit of pronghorn hunting. I started in South Dakota when I was still in my oh, late teens or early 20s, and I've been enjoying it ever since. So what this article about is first-time antelope hunters. A little subtitle here says, First-time antelope hunters quickly learn that sneaking within range of a buck can be the ultimate spot and stalk challenge. And I agree. So let's read what I had to say way back in 96, Discovering Pronghorn. By Ron Spomer. First time pronghorn hunters get it all wrong. I know I did. Having evolved hunting cottontails and pheasants, and then whitetails and mule deer, I naturally looked for my first antelope under the covers. Sure, I'd read all about the species' unique high plains environment, the endless horizons, and the short grass, but I couldn't believe any animal was dumb enough to stand out in the open and get shot at when it could hide in a nearby brushy draw. For goodness sakes, guys, duck! Well, they didn't duck, and I spent the first day of my pronghorn hunting career busting through more vegetation than any self-respecting antelope would be caught dead in. My second mistake, and this one's a classic, was carrying a Winchester Model 94 3030, the old white tail woods gun with its original open sights. This is not to say that the 3030 with open sights has not killed plenty of antelope, but it isn't the tool of choice for experienced high plains stalkers. I eventually crawled close enough to shoot a small buck with that lever action, but only after missing a half a dozen shots earlier. That was more than 20 years ago. These days, I see the opposite extreme. Eastern hunters are armed to the teeth with heavy, cheek-biting, ear-splitting super magnums with scopes large enough to hold a triple scoop of double Dutch chocolate and bullets heavy enough to take out an Abrams tank. Somewhere, someone is spreading some pretty wild gossip about our 130-pound antelope. Get real. These are animals, folks, not cartoon superheroes. Relax, slow down, unload your magnums, and fill up instead on a little information. First, pronghorns are indeed remarkable animals deserving of the utmost respect. They don't have eight-power binocular vision, but they can resolve images at far greater distances than we can. And when they spot something they don't like, they can put it behind them at the rate of 55 miles an hour, some say 65. You aren't going to walk up and bonk them on the head with a club. However, typical antelope habitat is not one giant salt pan. Plains, Rocky Mountains, foothills, and sagebrush slopes are usually cut, wrinkled, and folded into a stalker's paradise. The cautious hunter can pick his route and crawl within 300, 200, even 100 yards of his quarry, 
All this is done in daylight, making small 2x to 8x scopes ideal sighting mechanisms and mid-sized center fire calibers ideal bullet throwers. The 243 Winchester, 6mm Remington, 25 out 6, and 270 are perfect cartridges. There's nothing wrong with the 257 Roberts either, nor the 284 Winchester, 280 Remington, 308, or 30 out 6. The smaller Weatherby Magnums will toss bullets a little farther than these standard rounds, but they aren't really necessary. Despite their reputations, most antelope are taken at under 300 yards. If you must use a 7 rem mag or a 300 Winchester Magnum, load the lighter 100 to 150 grain bullets. The secret to antelope hunting is not firepower, but stealth, patience, and careful execution. The surest way to screw up is to hurry, to get frustrated, and to start running and gunning. Unfortunately, too many dudes have in the past done just that, ruining the hunt not only for everyone else, but for themselves as well. They consider a fast four-wheel drive vehicle more important than boots, sometimes more important than their rifle. This, of course, is illegal, it's disgusting, and it's just plain silly. But the plains are big, windy country where ethics are easily blown from weak grips. Back in the mid-1970s, I ranted and raved when mechanized hunters spoiled the aesthetics of my pronghorn stalks. But soon I realized that they actually increased my success. By spooking game, they drove it into isolated secure areas where vehicles couldn't reach. And there I was able to stalk and glass and stalk some more until I found the best box. First, I had to get over my anxiety that all the good bucks would be terminated by mid-morning. Few actually were. When making my first Idaho antelope hunt 10 years later, I used this knowledge to wait out the mechanized rush of opening morning, watching herds flee into the foothills. By midday, I had the game all to myself, back in quiet little draws and high basins. Stalking was easy, and I did it for four days before returning to the largest buck that I'd found. Despite the opening morning Toyotas and Fords, he'd survived until I crept within 80 yards. Again, patience is the key. Don't panic. Don't get hot under the collar. Just watch carefully. Let the hot rodders burn rubber and wait your turn. Another useful bit of information, and I'm amazed at how few hunters realize this, is that pronghorns are highly territorial over most of their range. One expects this of a whitetail in close cover, but out in big sky country where a fleet-footed ungulate could run to the horizon, well, you sort of expect them to. Well, the antelope doesn't. I got my first inkling of this in eastern Wyoming back in 1979. After stalking a prime 14-inch buck and shooting him at a watering hole shortly after sunrise, I retired to a knob to watch my buddy and two other hunters pursue a large band of pronghorns. Initially, the herd disappeared at high speed, trailing dust north through a notch in distant hills. But within an hour, they reappeared about a mile west, running when disturbed by a poor stalker or a frustrated pickup driver, and then settling down to browse and rest when they again felt safe. By noon, they had made a complete circuit roughly two miles per side and had once again run through that distant notch. By mid-afternoon, they again passed beneath me and headed for that same gap. Near sunset, they were looping toward me for the third time, but I had clued in my partner, and he lay waiting in the notch. By dark, his buck was hanging beside mine in a lonely cottonwood while we listened to the campfire pop in syncopation with howling coyotes. Over the years, I've remembered that lesson, and I've employed it to take several fine bucks, including a 15-inch beauty late in 1994. The season south of Gillette, Wyoming, had been open for two weeks before I arrived, and common sense suggested that all the trophies had been shot. Fortunately, I was hunting with experienced guides at the Dick Mankin Ranch, and they knew where a few old bucks had hidden out. Well, we spotted one on our first evening, right about where Jimmy said he'd seen them the day before. And though we had him cornered, when another herd trotted up from behind us, snorted an alarm, and raced away, alerting our buck and taking him with them. The following morning, we returned to the area, but it was empty. At this juncture, many novice pronghorn hunters shrugged their shoulders and moved to fresh country. 
Well, not this guy. He's here, Jimmy said, as he methodically glassed the convoluted sage hills. Might be down in a draw, might be behind a ridge, but he's here. Just keep looking. Well, we kept looking. Sure enough, the big buck suddenly materialized in a broad basin with a big herd of does less than a mile from where he had spooked him the previous evening. Exactly where they had been hiding the first few times we'd glassed that area was hard to say. Most likely there was an imperceptible roll to the ground. Perhaps they'd been lying in a shallow swale. Regardless, our persistence had been rewarded. While Jimmy watched, I stalked and fired one 25-06 round. Once again, a pronghorn's territorial fidelity contributed to a successful hunt. Pronghorn hunting requires a bit of boot leather, but a binocular is far more useful. Select a high point in glass, 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 noting where herds feed, where they water, where they wander. Do this a day or two before the season opens and you can often position yourself for a shot at sunrise. In 1994, I bow hunted antelope in eastern Idaho where I found one band so wedded to a particular alfalfa field that they returned to it in the dark after I blew an evening stalk that had pushed them across the deep draw more than a mile away. I know they made the return by moonlight because I found them in that alfalfa at the crack of dawn. Obviously, pronghorns are not strictly diurnal. Curiosity is another pronghorn behavioral trait that modern hunters seem to have forgotten. Old timers lured the little prairie ungulates within black powder range by waving a white flag on a stick. Modern archers, following the lead of Mel Dutton of Faith, South Dakota, wave a fake antelope decoy. Dutton's lightweight folding two-dimensional decoy has changed the art of pronghorn bow hunting. What used to be a tough stalking game or a boring wait at a waterhole has become as exciting as decoying geese or calling turkeys. Add the sound effects of a primos buck antelope call and you're asking to get gored. This game is played in September when bucks begin feeling territorial. In a selfish effort to save all breeding does for themselves, each buck attempts to drive the other bucks from his vicinity through a combination of scent marking, horn displaying, and snort calling. Pop up a small buck decoy in view of a boss buck, blow a challenge with your mouth collar, and get ready. Despite their famous visual powers, bucks often charge this decoy to within 30 yards or less. Bow hunters hiding behind that decoy can usually rise on their knees, draw, and shoot before their quarry figures out <laughs> what's going on. It's an exciting way to bow hunt, but too dangerous during the rifle season. I wouldn't want to ambush a buck during a rifle hunt anyway. That would cost me my chance to play what I consider is the quintessential rifleman's game, a glass and stock hunt. If one's ideal of open country hunting is to spot and select a specific animal, then execute a perfect stock and make a clean one-shot kill, pronghorn hunting is the way to do it. Now that bison are virtually domesticated cattle and bighorn sheep are relegated to extremely limited hunting in high mountain terrain, pronghorns are the last diurnal open country game remaining for North American hunters. This is an enterprise to relish. It's a throwback to the 19th century when the high plains were the North American Serengeti, free and open. In order to recreate the flavor of those unfettered days, I like to hunt big private ranches or arrive on vast public areas after opening weekend swarms have gone home. I erect a small tent under a cottonwood, a pine, or a juniper, collect a supply of firewood, and settle in. At dawn, I hike to a high point with binoculars, a spotting scope, rifle, and lunch in a day pack. There, I soak up the scent and the sounds of the plains while the eastern sky grows purple and the first orange shafts burnish yellow buffalo grass. White antelope rumps flash in the morning sun like semaphores. You often hear bucks snorting territorial warnings before you see them, and then they appear hundreds of yards farther than you guessed. So clear and pure is the air. You focus the spotting scope on the biggest ones, admiring deeply hooked horns, comparing prong size to ear length, sucking in your breath at the flash of a black heavy horn that towers over its bearer's head. After noting general herd locations, you hike a mile or two and glass fresh terrain, comparing trophies and adding up possibilities. 
When satisfied, you found the perfect buck, sometimes the first afternoon, sometimes not for several days, you return to its territory and begin looking for an opportunity. You watch patiently while he and his does feed in a flat, an open basin. You plan an interception when they move toward a creek to water. You back off when the wind switches. You try an alternative route. You stop when cover gives out. You wait, watch, pull cactus spines from your shins. And eventually, it all comes together. The land, the wind, the buck, and you. Your heart is crashing in your chest as you squirm over the last rise. Sage dust is in your nose, sweat against your checkered walnut. You see horn tips bobbing over gray brush, then tan ears, sparkling black eyes. You freeze. The head dips to feed and you push forward, seeing the body now, pushing your pack under the rifle. The crosshairs find the dark hollow behind the front shoulder. The buck lifts his head, cocks an ear at the click of your safety. A metal arc calls a short note, and an airplane drones in the far distance, but you do not hear them or the crack of the rifle between your hands. The buck dashes forward 20 yards, 30, 40, and you begin to fear you've missed. You bolt home another round, frantically trying to swing the crosshairs in front of that buck's chest. Then he curves downhill, suddenly running right at you, and you know he's heart shot. The stag stumbles, fall, dead. You sit up. You look at it all. The plain, the far horizon, pale blue over distant mountains like dark clouds, the land spreading yellow and gray, buffalo grass brittle and dead beside you, rabbit brush flowers glowing yellow. You hear again the flit of the metal arc, the last hum of the disappearing plain, and then air, just the soft hush of air expanding outward, filling your ears, the prairie, the sky. When you walk to your prize and lift the salad horns, you smell the pleasant stink of antelope oil and know that each time you see and feel those horns, you will remember this place, this life, and this freedom. Gee, I think I want to go uh, pronghorn hunting again. <laughs> I remember how much fun it was camping out alone on those vast prairies. Yeah, the wind can blow and just it gets miserable when that happens. <laughs> In Wyoming, it almost always happens. But there are those glorious days when you can feel the air and almost hear it breathe and hear the, all the calls of the wildlife that's still out there and Early October is usually when the when the season is. It's a special time of the year, and and, and it's really empty because by then uh, kids have gone back to school and people are done with their summer vacations. And it's just a a time when you feel like the population on the continent has probably dropped in half, <laughs> and you're the only one out there. Especially if you don't go on opening weekend, the crowds are usually back home again. They've gotten their antelope. So it's just you and the prairie and the pronghorns and the coyotes, and it is just a glorious way to hunt. So if you do want to take your first adventure out west and discover pronghorn hunting, more power to you. This is one of the animals that you can pretty successfully hunt on your own. You don't necessarily need a guide. You know, as I said at the start, it's open country. They're easy to spot and see. And then it just becomes a matter of patience and and glassing, finding your animal, working the wind, and stalking. As I said, the quintessential open country rifleman's hunt. So uh, check out your resources. You got to get online with the different states that have pronghorn hunting. And that would be probably North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska, a little bit of Kansas. I don't know if they allow non-residents. But then the plains really start with Colorado, Wyoming, and Montana. A little bit up into uh, Alberta. Idaho, Montana is really big, and uh, a little bit into Nevada and Utah, and Arizona has some great antelope hunting. So, And there's a lot of public land in those states, so it's definitely possible to figure things out for yourself and have yourself a real adventure. And it's early enough in the fall that you don't have to worry too much about nasty weather. Yeah, you might get snowed on, yeah, but it's not going to settle in for the winter and blast you with sub-zero sub uh, temperatures, so... All around, it's a great hunt, and I definitely suggest you try it. And I think if you try it once, you'll be back for more. Hey, this is Ron Spomer. I invite you to subscribe to this channel and give us a thumbs up if you can. 
Also, check out Ron Spomer Outdoors, our main channel on which we cover a lot of ballistic topics and cartridges and rifles and stuff. And then we have RSOTV.com, which is a subscription service, $5 a month. And on there, we have a lot of hunting videos and some real in-depth looks at rifles and shotguns. We go into a lot of reviews and show how they work and why and all the rest of it. And also hand-loading. I demonstrate hand loading and we talk about how easy it is and what some of the challenges are and some of what tricks are to make your rifle shoot more accurately. It's all a lot of fun and it keeps your nose in the in the business for which you pine all summer until fall comes and then it's time to get out there after them. So here's wishing you the best. Ron Spomer signing off. Hunt honest and shoot straight.